Sabbath to all of you. I bring you greetings from your brothers and sisters from Singapore, Indonesia, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Central Philippines and South Philippines, and Guam. These are the places that I have been to during this past more than one month, attending the Union sessions and attached mission sessions in the Southern Asia Pacific Division. I was in Bangladesh when I received the email from Evandale asking if I could come and at least address this conference during its opening. I was not sure if I could come home. You know, many times during these past four weeks, more than four weeks, even in the evenings we are at the airport, sometimes in the plane, we arrive in the place two o'clock in the morning, settle in our hotels at three o'clock, wake up at seven o'clock in the morning and 7.30 we are at meetings. But there is one thing I want to tell you young people during these meetings. It was a great joy for me to see our people. Every time I went inside the meeting room, I see our people kneeling down in prayer. The revival is beginning in the Southern Asia Pacific Division. 777 is working in the Southern Asia Pacific Division. I was so impressed when we were in Maryland during the General Conference Annual Council last October. We decided to do the same thing at the Southern Asia Pacific Division Annual Council. And the union leaderships decided to do the same thing. So much so that when I enter the function hall of the hotel where the session was going to take place, when I enter, I see people, our people, young people, old people, women, children, kneeling down and pleading for the Holy Spirit's presence. And I'll tell you, young people, I could only praise God because I have been to so many sessions in the 24 years that I have been in church administration. I have not seen something like this happen all because of prayer. The sessions have been peaceful. The elections, the nominating committees have been very peaceful and we praise God. The elections went on very, very, <clears throat> very well. And the people that have been appointed or elected to various positions in the church during the next, for the next five years are very satisfactory. I was here during the prayer camp meeting. You heard me preach about prayer. Tonight, I want to bring you something. While we were in Bangladesh, I took hold of a journal <coughs> where I got some little statistics about the population of the earth. In one day, during the 24 hours or the 1,440 minutes or 86,400 seconds, the world, as it turns around its axis, on average, we are told that 358,522 babies <coughs> are born. I'm sorry, I'd like to apologize after traveling so much and exposed to so much uh, lack of sleep. Sometimes our nominating committees would go until one, one o'clock in the morning you go back to your room, you have no rest. This is the result. But I pray to God that you will let us finish this presentation this evening. 358 
22,522 new babies are born every day. Only 155,012 people die. In other words, 203,000 510 people are added into the world's population every day. What about conversion or baptism into the Seventh-day Adventist Church? During the recent annual council, we have been told that on the average, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is now baptizing 2,800 people every day. And what is that? What is 2,800 new converts convert compared to 203,510 <coughs> people added into the world's population? And here is some more staggering statistics. We are told that the world's population will reach 7 billion by the year 2011. Currently, over a billion people in China, another billion people in India. <coughs> the continent of Africa has just reached one billion mark. And of the 6.8 <coughs> billion people, Approximately 30% or 2.2 billion are Christians. 1.5 billion Muslims. 1.1 billion secular agnostics and atheists. 900 million Hindus. 376 million Buddhists and hundreds of other religious groups. Oftentimes we hear and we rejoice when we are told that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is one of the fastest growing Christian denominations in the world. Currently we have about 16.7 million members, which is approximately 1% of all Christians in the planet, on planet Earth. But what is 16.7 million against 7 billion people. That is a very small fraction of 1%. This brings our minds to some questions. How will the work of God on earth ever be finished? Is it possible for the gospel in the context of three angels' messages to circle the globe in a relatively short time? What will give us the breakthrough in the proclamation of the gospel that we long for? And finally, we ask the question, when will we see the fulfillment of Jesus' words? This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. And then, the end will come. When I was 11 years old, I was, I was working as a, an Iran boy to the only Seventh-day Adventist physician in our town. One day, the district pastor came to our town. And as he always would do, he would tell my father, Brother Gulfan, rent a public address system, put a table in front of your shop, and we will preach tonight. He was an itinerant preacher. And as long as he was there, every night he would preach. And one day he said, Brothers and sisters, I want to let you know that Jesus is coming soon. That was Sabbath. At noontime while having lunch, my boss, the Adventist doctor, said to me, Albert, this preaching about the coming of Jesus as very soon I have heard when I was still wearing my short pants. I am now 
more than 65 years old, Jesus has not yet come. And I ask him, Doctor, do you mean then that Jesus is not coming as he has promised? He said, I really don't know. But you ask me, my brothers and sisters, my dear young people, you ask me, Pastor Gulfan, do you believe that Jesus is coming soon? I'll tell you, without any question, without any doubt, I know that Jesus is coming and he is coming in my day. How can you say that, Pastor Wolfgang? I just turned 60. So now I am, I am a senior citizen. But I have great faith to believe, young people, that Jesus is coming in my day and that if I were careful with my health habits, I will still be alive and strong when he comes again. You ask me, how will that be possible? Let me remind you, my friends. The mission of reaching lost people with the everlasting gospel is not our mission. The mission of reaching lost people with the everlasting gospel is God's mission. It is not ours. And he only invites us to cooperate with him in the finishing of his work. Remember this, my friends, when God asks us to do something, he will empower us to do that thing. And that promised empowerment is still yours, is still mine, is still ours today. After the resurrection, Jesus showed himself up several times to his disciples. And during the last meeting, just before he ascended back to heaven, as recorded in the book of Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Now, verse 9 tells us that Jesus... After he had spoken these words, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of sight. But just before he was taken up to heaven, note, he repeated the promise. The promise, he said in verse 8, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. My friends, the promise of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit was repeated just before he ascended back to heaven. And verses 12 to 14, we see the early Christian church, 120 of them in the upper room. That upper room experience, whereas a few days before the crucifixion of Jesus, the apostles, the 12 apostles, were asking who was going to be great among themselves. In fact, one mother was so brave enough, so courageous enough to come to Jesus and ask Jesus, Lord, when you establish your kingdom and when you sit in your throne, let my two children be on your sides, one on the right and one on the left. Wow, and I could imagine Peter, probably the most senior among the 12 apostles, I could imagine Peter saying to himself, what? But in the upper room, what a beautiful picture. When they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. Verse 14, this all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. All continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. In verse 15, we are told that the altogether the number was about 120,000. 
120 people. They were praying. They set aside their differences. They set aside their, their political ambitions. The aspiration for position, for power, was no longer there. All what they wanted was the fulfillment of the promised power of the Holy Spirit. And on the day of Pentecost, my friends, according to the scripture readings that we had today, on the day of Pentecost, when that day had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. How many were filled with the power of the Holy Spirit? Did it say some of them were filled with the Holy Spirit? Was it only the 12 apostles who were filled with the Holy Spirit? Were only the women, the few women who were with them, were filled with the Holy Spirit? Friends, my Bible says, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them Adherence. And you know the, the rest of the story. One evangelistic meeting, 3,000 baptism. Wow. You know, when I conducted my first evangelistic meeting after nine years of college preparation for ministerial training, after nine years, I finally graduated and landed into the church work. I was now a paid worker by the church, paid with the tight money of the brethren. And I was so happy, I was so bold. I said, I'm ready. I have not wasted my time in college. Then when I was assigned to become a pastor of a small city church, I said, I will conduct my first evangelistic meeting. I did. I knew my Bible doctrine. I could defend the, the teachings of the Seventh-day Adventist church. I knew my English was all, was good. <coughs> And I said, I will impress this church that I am a man to watch. And I went and conducted my evangelistic meeting. One month I preached. Every night the hall was filled with people. One evening the union president came and visited and said, Albert, how could you gather so many people? And we did not have this gadgets in those days when I started my ministry. No laptop. No computers, nothing. All I had was the small Hope for Today projector manual. You put a slide film, push it, remove it, push again another one. That was all we had in those days when I started my ministry 35 years ago. And people came. The father of the parish priest of the town came and said to me, Mr. Gurpan, this is wonderful. If only it were not too embarrassing for my son, who is the parish priest of this town, I would like to become a Seventh-day Adventist. But at the end of the one-man series, do you know how many baptisms I had? Zero. And I praise God for giving me that lesson early in my ministry. Sometimes we become so overly confident with ourselves. Sometimes we think that we can turn the Bible any page and we can defend the doctrines of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. But friends, it is not your capability. It is not your talent. It is not even your knowledge, your wisdom, your strength that will make you success. I realized later on that the reason why I failed in my first evangelistic meeting as a young preacher, I was only 25 at that, that time. Young person, 25 years old, when I conducted my first evangelistic meeting as a young ministerial intern. I did not feel my need to pray. I knew my doctrine. I knew my Bible. 
Why pray? And God said to me, Gulfan, I will give you a lesson. No baptism. And how, uh, what an embarrassing experience was it was for me. But on the day of Pentecost, one evangelistic sermon, 3,000 baptism. Another time in the book of Acts, we are told that another sermon, 5,000 baptism. Later on, Dr. Liu could not count anymore so much, so he just said, and multitudes were added into the church daily. Oh my, I said to myself, this is the secret. This is where we are going to finish the work. Pray for the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Young people, the leadership of the Seventh-day Adventist Church this time believes in the potential of the young people of the church. And we at the division share that same belief. So much so, I want to tell you that in all the union executive committees now, in the 10 unions and attached missions that we have in the Southern Asia Pacific Division, Every union executive committee has at least one or two young people who are members of the executive committee. In Central Philippines, it's not only three, it's not only two. They have in every conference one youth representative in the executive committee. We believe in the potential of our youth. I believe in what Sister White said in this book, Messages to Young People. Page 196. With such an army of workers as our youth, rightly trained, mindfulness, how soon the message of a crucified, risen, and soon coming Savior might be carried to the whole world. How soon might the end come? The end of suffering and sorrow and sin. How soon in a place of possession here with this blight of sin and pain our children might receive their inheritance where the righteous shall inherit the land and dwell therein forever. Where the inhabitant will not say, I am sick. Oh, I long for that day, my friends. You know, I have been, I have been a sickly person since I was an infant. In fact, during my last year in college, we had a joke. Three of us were very sickly. And unfortunately, one could not even graduate one month before graduation. He passed away. But sometimes the three of us would joke towards each other. And they would tell me, my friends would tell me, Oh, Albert, before you finish your internship, you just apply for permanent disability. Because I was always sick. I long for that day when Jesus will come and we will be in the land where the inhabitants shall not say I am sick and the voice of weeping shall be no more heard. And it can be done. What did Sister White say? With such an army of workers as our youth rightly trained, I would like to commend the administration of the Adventist University of the Philippines. I would like to commend the leadership of the, of the Department of Religious Affairs of this university and the PIC Church for allowing this conference to take place. Young people, I would encourage you to avail of every training there is during the next five days. Every time I see some things like this, I could only wish that during my time, activities like this were happening in the church. There were none. I'm so happy. My two sons, who are now in the United States, one on the western coast and one on the eastern coast, one in California, one in Florida, they said to me, Daddy, 
we will not be looking for so much money anymore. We want to devote our time for mission work. My youngest son, who is a graduate of Philippine, oh, Adventist University of the Philippines, every Sunday, he has a team that goes down to L.A. and they distribute Steps of Christ and the Great Controversy. And we need more young people to do something for God. I challenge you, my dear young people. You are the cream of this church. 60% of the membership of the church are aged below 35. You are the hope of the church. You can make a difference. You can be instrumental in finishing the work. But the promised power of the Holy Spirit can only be ours if we are like the disciples of the early Christian church. People of one accord. In the book, Acts of the Apostles, page 37, Sister White said, <clears throat> When the disciples met together in the upper room, they put away all differences all desire for supremacy. They came close together in Christian fellowship. They drew nearer and nearer to God. And as they did this, they realized what a privilege had been theirs in being permitted to associate so closely with Christ. Sadness filled their hearts as they thought of how many times they had grieved Him by their slowness of comprehension, their failure to understand the lessons that for their good he was trying to teach them. Mrs. White says that during these days of preparation, these were days of deep heart searching. Brethren, I, I believe that the Holy Spirit will be given to us if we all work together like the early Christian church. If you have your Bibles with you, I would like to invite you to turn your Bibles to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 29. <clears throat> and whoever finds the first verse, please be courageous enough to stand. Acts chapter 29, verse 1. Anybody, please? Yes, you are right. There is no Acts chapter 29. Why? It is yet to be written. And God longs for this church to write Acts part 2 beginning with chapter 29 friends Jesus is just waiting waiting to repeat the Pentecostal experience I would like to appeal to you dearly beloved faculty parents who are here young people who are here please let us remove from our minds the antagonism of some people when we speak about the Holy Spirit. You know, I feel sad sometimes when I speak, when I preach about our need of the power of the Holy Spirit, some people will come to me and say, Pastor Gulfan, have we become like Pentecostals? Let me remind us, friend, the power of the Holy Spirit is not for Pentecostals. It is for the church that believes in Jesus. 
It is for the church that is commissioned with a great gospel, the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ, which is to be preached into all the world, to every creature, kindred, tongue, and people. The Holy Spirit is promised to the whole church, not just to few individuals. Not only those who are coming to this PYC conference, not just to those who are attending the same kind of meeting right there in Cebu City today. The whole church is being invited to receive the fullness of the lottering power of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said, when the lottering power is poured upon his people, he said, when the comforter is come, you will do greater things than what I have done. Friends, fellow believers, let us make God do this to us in our generation. Yes, I'm no longer worried about not being able to finish the work. God will finish the work. Here's a beautiful picture of the great, written by Sister White in the Great Controversy, page 612. And this will be my closing quotation. <coughs> Sister White saw this beautiful picture as we come to the close of time. She said, Servants of God, with their faces lighted up and shining with holy consecration, will hasten from place to place to proclaim the message from heaven. By thousands of voices all over the earth, the warning will be given. Miracles will be wrought. The sick will be healed. Signs and wonders will follow by the believers. The message will be carried not so much by argument as by the deep conviction of the Spirit of God. Empower. And God is waiting for His church to receive this empowerment. The work of God will be finished. The mission will be accomplished. The task will be complete. Jesus will come to deliver His people. He will come as a mighty deliverer. He will come as King of kings and Lord of lords. He will come as victorious conqueror. He will come to take his children home and we shall fall at his feet and sing. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. The work on earth will be over and we shall praise him through the ceaseless ages of eternity. Church, May our prayer be the prayer of John the Revelator as he closed the book. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. I'm tired of the sick world. I long to go home. I hope it is your desire too. And we can make it happen. May God bless this conference. I shall be praying for you, young people. I will not be able to come and be here with you every day. But once in a while, I'll be here. I assure you, we love you. We support you. As I have assured the president of the generation of GYC, Justin, I told Justin, I love the young people of my church. And I want to be there to do anything that I could to support them and to encourage them. And that is why I am here, even though I'm not feeling it. May God bless you. Enjoy every bit of whatever there is to be enjoyed during the next five days. And let the Holy Spirit fill you and join us in the whole division. Our theme in the division, in harmony with the General Conference theme, is revival, 
reformation and beyond. In all the unions that we have visited, people were asking me, what is the meaning of beyond? Revival, we understand. Reformation, we understand. But what is beyond? My explanation to this is, we have had calls for revivals in the past. Yes, we experienced revival in some places. But those revivals were just there for a while, and then they, were di they died off. What we want to see in the Southern Asia Pacific Division is that kind of revival, that kind of strengthening, that kind of enlivening, that kind of enthusiasm that will produce reformation in the lives of the people of the church, both individually and corporately, that will ultimately usher in the return of Jesus. That is the beyond. My friends, let us rally together and ask God to do it in our day. This is my prayer tonight.